Hello, and welcome to the ESG Experience podcast brought to you by Conservus ESG. I'm Healy Lev, Conservus ESG's Chief Revenue Officer. And I'm Ryan Nelson, Conservus ESG's CEO, and we're your hosts for today's episode. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes in the ESG universe to understand how it can help with engaging stakeholders, mitigating risks, and attracting investors, or because you value this planet and its humans, this podcast is for you. Together, we will navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, discuss ideas, review strategies, and share industry news and trends. In today's episode, we are very pleased to be joined by Greg Fasulo, CEO of Elevation, to discuss trends, developments, opportunities, and benefits of energy efficiency and sustainability in the home rentals market. Greg has a BSEE from Lehigh University, an MSEE from UC Berkeley, an executive MBA from Southern Methodist University. Ryan, you're going to be able to keep up with this guy? Absolutely not. Okay, great. Um, intimidating background here. Well, it's, uh, now that I see he has 14 U.S. patents. I know, also, I hadn't I even gotten to that. Read about the U.S. How many patents do you have? Uh, we'll get into that later. Okay, we'll table that one. He's a proven visionary and operational leader who took the helm as CEO of Elevation in early 2020. In this role, he is focused on the strategy, structure, and tactics to raise capital successfully, accelerate growth, position the company at the leading edge of the shift to smart home energy technology. Previously, he has been at the forefront of the global telecom broadband, smart building, and industrial IoT industries in multiple successful runs. He has built and managed international organizations that scale to thousands of employees and millions in revenue. Greg, welcome. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Thank you, Healy. Um, Ryan, great to be here. Looking forward to it. So let me hit you right out of the gate with this one. What is going on in single family home rentals th- these days? Who actually owns these homes and what are their motivations? And just as, a, as an individual, as a consumer, like we're all very curious. Is this new? Has it always been like this? What, what are we seeing? I imagine you have a point of view on that. Yeah, it, good question. So, so a lot. Um, in short, it's an exciting time in energy. It's an exciting time in housing. Um, there are about 140 million households in the United States. Um, that's a mix of people who live in apartments, multifamily, and single-family homes. About 90 million of those people live in a single-family home, which they either rent or they own. And of those 90 million homes, roughly 20 million are rented properties. Now, most landlords are people like us who have a second house or a third house and they rent it out. Um, Of those 20 million homes, 98% uh, roughly are owned by people who have less than five properties. But what what is changing and is gonna change the industry dramatically is the emergence of large institutional operators of single family rental properties. Um, These are companies like Invitation Homes, American Homes for Rent and others. Those are two of the big public companies, but there are plenty of investors that are looking at markets. They are buying homes and creating portfolios. Um, and, and, and the reason that this is happening, if you think about living in a rented property and, and sometimes people can afford and, and they buy a house and, and you're stable and you're in a certain area, there are a lot of reasons why people would prefer to rent rather than own, and that's not new. Um, there have been renters um, since, since people started owning homes. Sure. But what's changing is um, the ability to operate these homes um, as a large portfolio. So rather than owning a handful of homes, five homes, can you own a larger number of homes, a thousand homes? By doing that, can you have economies of scale and you can offer a very uh, competitive rent and a very nice place to live? And increasingly what's happening is with the shortage in homes, as you're building communities of homes, as builders are building, uh, the opportunity to build communities that are designed for rental as opposed to ownership. Today, there are about 300,000 homes that are owned by large institutional landlords. There's almost $100 billion of capital that's being put to work today, either to buy homes or build homes, uh, which we desperately need because there's a a shortage of housing um, that dates back all the way to the, the, the downturn in 2010. But these um, institutional operators have figured out that they can build a business model, they can create communities, they can create a better experience. Um, And at the same time, with the pandemic and people working from home and spending more time at home, if you have the choice of living in a multi-story, multi-family apartment building, 
or living in a small house in a very nice neighborhood with a backyard and a garage and you can walk outside and walk the dog and, uh, and play with your family. Um, there's a strong desire to live in the neighborhoods that these companies are creating. So um, what's going to happen over the next decade, it's projected that there will be as many as 3 million institutionally owned single family homes. Um, and just like most apartments are owned by large companies that, uh, that operate them and deliver amenities and service. You're going to start to see communities pop up that are rented communities. These are I mean, beautiful homes. I was in one in, in Las Vegas a few weeks ago, and uh, they're just breaking ground on a 90 home community, but it'll have a pool and an amenity center. And um, it's it's really kind of a nice trend. So dramatic trends, it's, it's going to shift um, the availability of homes as places to live and the flexibility of the sharing economy um, over the next decade. So it's in the early days and it's a, it's a trend that's accelerating and, uh, um, I think it, it offers a lot of benefit. So I love that positive perspective. And I just want to reiterate for a second the numbers that you mentioned. So 98% are not institutional investors. Only 2% or 300,000 homes are owned by institutional investors. So still a very, very small amount overall, and perhaps it will grow. So and why I'll say that I appreciate your positive you know, lens on this is because there has been a lot of um, backlash or just articles about how these institutions are pricing out you, know, you and me and just regular hardworking American that wants to buy a home because now they have to compete with these folks that just have these all cash offers and they'll overpay and they make it sound like you know, perhaps these institutional investors are monsters. So it's great to hear the flip side, right? Um, that they are creating opportunity for people to live that life that couldn't otherwise afford a home or that would be living in an apartment and wouldn't have the amenities of a yard or a pool or a nice community or playground. Um, and also that it's not this overwhelming number of homes that are owned by these institutional investors just yet or at all. It really is still just a small percentage. So I appreciate that perspective just um, first and foremost and you know, on behalf of our customers, our joint customers. Um, yeah, I I, and Healy, I think I'd tack on top of that. Look, they're, they're an easy target, right? So, so we live in a world today where the soundbite, um, the politician that can kind of um, create an issue or leverage an issue to, to enhance their own position. Um, yeah, it's easy to poke at the big, bad Wall Street landlord, this, this bad company that's coming in and destroying the American dream. Uh, totally. It couldn't be further from the truth when you look yeah. at the facts. I mean, these are nice communities and, and there's a, They'll, they'll, they'll leverage a perception that people, oh, they don't want to rent. And these are low quality homes. Well, it's a competitive market. If you're going to rent a house, it's got to be in a nice home in a nice neighborhood. It's got to be safe. It's got to be clean. People are looking for amenities um, and they're looking for flexibility. So rather than buy a home, I'm, I'm moving to a new area. Um, maybe my kids are getting out of the house and they're in college and I'm looking for flexibility. There's lots of reasons why people want to live in a rented property. In the past, your option was to live really an apartment um, in high density or yeah. to, to find a small landlord with a house and then who knows what the service is like. And now you can have that exceptional service and that really nice home. You could do it at scale. Um, you're going to see these properties designed for vacation homes, build to stay, they call it, as opposed to just to build to rent where you're, you're living there. Um, so, so we're going to see the, the entire landscape of residential housing change being driven by these these large companies who do see an opportunity to make money by doing a, a good job but what they're doing is beneficial and they're creating value in a very competitive market so uh, they're they're an easy punching bag but i don't think that uh, yeah. um, that story reflects reality well yes thank you for helping us debunk that so great opportunity for our collective businesses right you being in the energy space and us being in the esg space and looking at these folks that it's basically a new asset class right it's an emerging new asset class from an institutional standpoint um, and we know rental homes, they're, for whatever reason, especially prone to higher energy usage. Um, now, I'm wondering in your area of expertise, is that because, you know, they're not paying the bills directly because these people don't care as so they leave their lights on because essentially they pay their rent and their utilities are included, so they don't care? Or why else? Like, why are these uh, rental homes higher, known to have higher energy usage than perhaps owned ones or perhaps other asset classes? Yeah, I think I'd step back a little bit. Um, in general, if you're a homeowner, if you're a consumer, energy is a really difficult thing to make tangible and to make actionable. So most most homeowners, um, they'll, they'll think about energy. The statistic is eight minutes a year. So eight minutes a year, and those eight minutes are when you're paying the bill. Yeah. So I use energy today in my house. Um, 60 days from now, I'll have a bill in the mail and I'll pay it. Um, and it's a $160 a month, it's $260 a month, it's $360 a month. 
it's really not something that I understand and I can take action and then I can get some feedback on, on, on how, I, um, how I impact my spend. So it's, I think there's, there's a fundamental issue with energy and electricity in a home that it's just when you get billed for it is so latent to when you use it, very difficult to understand and optimize. So, so we have a strategy around data, which we, uh, we could talk about a little bit here. But I think that's one issue. If I'm a consumer, I just don't understand energy. I'm thinking about my family and dinner on the table and all the things I've got going on. I get a bill and I pay it. Um, but what now, happens if you're, to your you're grandpa red... screaming about turning off the lights? You know, is that yeah. yes. he gone? Yes. Is that that still works. That yeah. still works. The kids are turning the lights on and uh, um, go push the temperature up on the thermostat. You don't want it so cold and, and all those things still work. Um, the... Uh, the other issue a renter has, I was going to attack on though, um, they really can't control anything. So, so in particular, one of the big revolutions we talk about this housing revolution. There's a revolution in residential energy at the moment, and this independence where you can put solar on your house or a battery on your house and be resilient and be independent of the electric grid, and you can create electricity from solar at a far lower cost than what you're paying. You can put in thermostats in a home, smart thermostats. You could do energy efficiency work where you do duct sealing and insulation in the home. You could replace windows. There's, there's investments you make as a homeowner into your house that make that house more efficient. When you're living in a rented property, you don't have that right. The landlord decides what they can do and what they want to do on that property. So to, to your point about the higher cost, um, we, we, I think it's a combination of those two. Lack, lack of understanding of energy and then lack of ability to invest in savings. And, and the result is then energy is typically the second highest bill after the rent itself in a rented home. And so you're, you're paying $2,000 a month for the rent and $200 a month for your electric bill um, in the summertime in a home. So it's, it's a high cost. And, uh, and frankly, with energy costs in some of the states this year um, going up by as much as 70%, um, look at states like Texas and how, how much energy costs have increased, that bill is becoming much more painful um as inflation rises and and everything else goes up in life so so i think it's a real problem and it's an opportunity to, if, if you can solve that problem so let me ask you this uh tell tell me if i've got this this right so i'm, I'm you know learning about the company that you're running elevation and it's kind of the story seems to be all right well you know renewable energy is is good let's put solar panels on homes and it's like well if we're just going to put solar panels on let's also make sure that we've done the things to reduce the energy use that's required anyhow. Well, let's also uh, track data and present it back so people have a different experience and can understand what is happening uh, and, and see it differently and know what know what the offenders are within their house, if you will. And so it seemed like these ad hoc things, and then we've heard of things called smart homes and that, and then you've got this concept, which I thought was awesome, uh, I call an elevated home, I believe, was the term that I see on there that seems to be the, the full s suite of it, but really sounds cool, really awesome, awesome images on the website. Can you, you know, did I get it right somewhat? You, you did. You did. That's actually, I actually started it backwards. I'd probably go the other direction um, to talk about kind of a, if I was educating a consumer on what they can do. It starts with understanding consumption of energy, how you use it, where you use it, when you use it, and what you should do differently. Um, making it tangible so it's in dollars as opposed to things that are more abstract like kilowatts and, and, and time of use and all the mm -hmm. arcane vocabulary in the utility space. Elevation is the parent company of an Austin-based technology company called Curb Energy. Curb is a little device that goes in the electric panel. It senses energy on every breaker several thousand times a second. We take that data, bring it up to the cloud, and then you get an app that you can see your data. So what's my air conditioner using and how many hours did it run? What's my dishwasher doing? What's my hot water tank doing? You can be very granular on energy, but we automate, we, we push notifications. We, we, we have a weekly email that goes out on tips and tricks and, and dollar savings. And we find we could save most homeowners 10 to 12% on their electricity. All of a sudden energy is easy to manage. If you did this different with your thermostat, if you ran your air conditioner a different way, if you changed, changed when you run your dishwasher or how many times a week you run your dishwasher, you could save a dollar, you could save $5, you could save $30. So we make energy um, understandable. We make the home intelligent with our curb device. Um, that data we can point out to equipment failures, 
We're in the process of tying that to warranty services. There's, there's really good use of that data. And that's step one. Now you've got a smart home. Energy is something you can interact with. The next logical thing is, well, how, where am I wasting energy? Homes are amazingly inefficient. Um, you have attics that are not insulated and insulation degrades over time. You have simple things like like all the penetrations that go in for ducts in the house and, and, and other areas of leakage. So we have a, uh, a BPI certified process where we go and pressure test a home, find the leakage, improve that, improve all the energy efficiency, um, the insulation in the home. We can get another 10 to 15%. Uh, reduction in energy. It's measured. So this is not just something where it's subjective and spraying insulation. Um, and it's, uh, we, at the moment, we've been a Department of Energy contractor of the year for four years in a row, uh, a contractor of sustained excellence. We believe we're the largest national energy efficiency retrofit company. So that's step two. Let's, um, I've, I, the analogy we use a lot is a gas tank. I'm driving my car and there's a leak in the gas tank. Well, rather than just keep filling it up with fuel, let's fix the leak in the gas tank. Um, now you've got an efficient home. You fix that leak in the gas tank, proverbially. Thanks for the me. last thing is there's there's technology to uh, to generate energy. Solar has a, a, a tremendous economic return. Um, that you got to be smart when you buy solar. There's a lot of unscrupulous people who door to door sell, and um, they they show up at your house and they convince you to buy. And it's almost like the the used car lot from 40 years ago. We didn't know pricing, so I I, I encourage consumers to educate themselves on solar buy it from a large reputable company like Elevation. Um, but we put solar on houses. We're the, one of the top 20 solar installers in the US today. And that last part of, of putting solar on, um, depending on where you live, literally the ROI without energy savings, energy efficiency, energy intelligence, just the ROI of solar itself makes sense. When you combine those other technologies, you produce that you spend, you understand how you use, and now you're producing energy it can make a tremendous impact on your cost uh, with paybacks that are, are, are five to seven years um, on that investment. If you live in a house, again, that, uh, that you're renting, you don't have that option, which is what's unique about Elevation is we are working with these large institutional landlords to deploy these technologies to benefit not just the homeowners that can afford to make the decision and can control that decision, but now bring clean energy and lower energy costs to the, uh, the broader population of people who rent. Yeah, it was... Um... It reminds me of a conversation I had yesterday with a colleague here and kind of goes back to where, where we started this conversation. But, you know, she she experienced and had some of those concerns we were talking about, about institutional investment into single family homes. We started talking about that. And uh, I was really impressed because because of that experience, she really leaned in and wanted to work with our single family home customers uh, to see their point of view and help them from an ESG perspective. And got to see that they are trying to be uh, as sustainable as they possibly can and be leaders in this space and do those types of things. And so we quickly talked about what are the benefits and we got to exactly that. Who has the capital yeah. to install solar? Not every single individual certainly does. And someone goes, oh, well, the ROI is, you know, only three years. And someone's like, yeah, but it doesn't matter what the ROI is. I don't have $15,000 or $30,000 or whatever it is. Whereas these institutional investors were now getting better homes and solar just like all over the place in a whole community at one time. So yeah. that there is something to that scale and that and that power, you know, the ability to do that. Yeah, I was gonna reiterate that well, that as well as a positive benefit, because even if there's creative financing, you don't have to outline capital, it's just the ability to tackle all communities at once or like at the onset rather than hurting cats, literally like the definition of hurting cats. So that's awesome. So it's and, and Healy, I was just to say real quick, that's a ben another benefit of these large institutional operators. So, so again, a small landlord with three or four homes doesn't have the capital to put solar on all those houses. Right. And, and, and then they're just putting solar on their house. They're not really adding that much value. Yeah. Um, an institutional operator with access to capital, um, and we're doing this, we're deploying a 90 home community just outside of Las Vegas. Every house will have solar. We're deploying another 100 home community in Florida. Every home will have solar. We're about to do another another community in Austin. Um, these developers are now recognizing, I mean, because energy cost is high, um, look, they want to offer benefits for people running that community. You're, you're going to pay dramatically lower electric bill because we're going to put this, this, this asset on the roof and we're going to capitalize it over the life of the property 20, 30 years. 
as a renter, you're only in that property maybe four years. I think the average is, is actually less than that today, but roughly three years. And over the next three years, it would make no sense to put solar on because you never get a return, but you're now leveraging their capital and their ability to reduce your energy costs. And they can do it at scale across the entire community, including the yeah. amenity center. So that's it's it's an emerging trend. The operators, it's new. They're not energy hasn't been something that they've focused on historically as part of their service. They let the tenant pay the bill. The, but right. but again, these large progressive operators are recognizing an opportunity to to add value. And, and that makes their community more desirable. It allows them to, to have people that want to stay in the community longer, which is, is profitable for them. So, so it's beneficial for them, but fundamentally it's now dramatically reducing the cost for the resident, which is, is just great. Yeah, and from an ESG standpoint as well, if those owners, if those institutional owners are leaning in and taking more accountability, you know, for the first point of reducing the actual energy. So going through that gas leak test and making sure the homes are more efficient out of the gate or making sure every home has solar, and then taking it one step further and kind of having a heavier hand in the billing piece. So when we're doing ESG reporting, right, we need access to the bills, the bill data, the data. That's the hardest thing sometimes to get is like you can't manage what you can't measure. We can't measure hundreds of thousands of bills across tens of thousands of homes from you and Ryan and me, you know, there, there needs to be a way to kind of centralize that. And I think that's happening a bit. Um, one other thing I want to ask you while we have you, um, talk to me a bit about legislation. So the Inflation Reduction Act, um, other legislation that will just impact the space in, in rental homes and energy efficiency. What's your take? And tell me about it, assuming that I'm a person that has zero patents, you know, <laughs> explain it to or what it, what it even is. Well, it's always always tough with legislation. We're still in the process right now. So so for those who aren't familiar with how legislation gets written and eventually turned into to law and policy, um, we're in the phase right now where the Inflation Reduction Act was agreed to and signed. It allocates buckets of money for different investments. And now all of that detail has to be legislated. So so even I don't understand exactly where it's going to end up, Ryan. We'll, uh, we'll see what happens over the next few months. But the fundamentals, look, the... Uh, the federal government came together on a package that's really going to fundamentally transform clean energy, energy efficiency, um, and very, very thoughtful how they did this. First, it's very large. There's a tremendous amount of money available. The basic thing for a homeowner is the um, the tax credit. So essentially, 30% of what you spend on a solar system or a battery now for your home, you get to credit against your taxes. So it's a cash rebate the next year on your taxes. That's the easy one to understand. In addition to that, there's roughly $4 billion that was allocated for energy efficiency programs. There's roughly twice that that was allocated for upgrades, so things like your air conditioner, even your electric panel on the side of the house. And then there were changes on tax policy. And one of the important ones, again, talking about the single family rental space, most of these single family rental companies are what, what are known as real estate investment trusts or REITs. Uh, REITs are a tax structure where there's essentially a pass-through tax um, benefit for the investors. And historically, because it's a pass-through tax entity, there's there's no taxes, no tax credits. Um, the taxes are paid not by that entity, but by the investors themselves. So the uh, the REITs could not participate in tax credits. They couldn't get this 30% savings. There's a marketplace that's going to be created where now REITs can, can sell and transfer tax credits. And that's a very subtle change and maybe a, a sophisticated change that most listeners um, wouldn't really think about. Well, what's the benefit of having REITs have, have access to these tax credits? Why is that good for me? Essentially, it's created a whole new way of investing in clean energy projects. So big wind farms, solar farms, and in the single family rental space, solar on the roofs of these homes. That by allowing that 30% to be something that those groups can monetize dramatically increases the amount of investors who are interested in putting capital behind programs and, and fundamentally these programs, their investments, they're expensive. You got to get the cash and the capital somewhere. So the government has opened up um, a new way or, or a much broader universe of potential capital partners to who can participate in the deployment of clean energy. I fundamentally think that that last piece and just opening up that marketplace is going to have the most dramatic impact um, on, on the adoption of clean energy across all the different sectors, whether it's it's large installations for utilities or it's um, community size installations or it's commercial installations or single family rental installations or even individual homeowners, 
but that ability to change the the thought process of REITs and broaden the access to capital, that access to capital is fuel, and we've just provided a ton of fuel to drive clean energy. Yeah, well, that's great. I think with pressures from individuals and consumers and then putting the right structures in place to make investors you know want to do these things it's almost sounding optimistic about the direction we're headed towards renewable energy and uh sustainable living in uh in this this country anyhow so so that's good news so okay so you've got this community it's beautiful it's got uh classy solar panels everywhere you got your yard you know it's built for you built to rent you might want to go have a coffee or you might want to go have a beer so that leads us into our next little segment here uh greg called beans or beer it's i'm going to ask you all you have to pick is if this place is a, a coffee brewer or a beer brewer it's just you, i'm going to tell you the name and you just tell me which one it is but don't don't google it um, I'm going <laughs> to what it is. Okay. This one is called four peaks beer. I know that one. You know that one. Yes. Do you know what's interesting and why I might've uh, picked four peaks brewing company today? Arizona, Arizona based. It's Tempe, Arizona, but, uh, check it out in 2020, they installed 500 solar panels on their roof and they claim for their YouTube that that all the beer brewed in that particular space anyway is from renewable energy sources um so i thought that was that was kind cool of cool. great stuff yeah well um well, yeah, uh, well people done. rarely win by the way rarely win you it's think? a 50 50 chance but i'd say more <laughs> people lose than win so Isn't good job yeah, yeah yeah well done and congrats well, you, pick, you picked an easy one if it had been, if it been somewhere else it would have been a lot more difficult he always picks them in the backyard of our podcast guest always yeah, so that's how we, we yeah. flush out if people are listening to the other ones or not. <laughs> yeah. Maybe have a clue, but uh, well, good. But thank you very much for that incredible insight uh, on this industry and on the education on the IRA and those things. Uh, really appreciate what you're, what you're doing at Elevation. Great. Thanks. So look, look. Thanks for having me. It's an exciting time. There's a lot going on. So I appreciate uh, you getting the word out, word out, and creating awareness because that's uh, that's what we need to do. So uh, so appreciate what you guys do as well. Agreed. And um, nice to meet you today. And thank you to our tens of hundreds of thousands of loyal listeners for joining us on the ESG Experience Podcast. There's a new episode every month. So if you enjoyed your time with us, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. We appreciate uh, that you continue to listen and support our podcast. And if you do want to continue the conversation between episodes, follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG experience. And we will catch you next time. Thanks again, Greg. Thanks, everybody. Thank you both.